Hello, everyone. Uh, we're going to talk today about MySQL analysis at scale. I see lots of people representing scale in this room, which makes our, us sweat a bit. But anyway, uh, me and Harrison are both working on our database performance team. So we actually, this is part of our work, is to analyze our workloads and understand what we have to do next. And uh, we essentially have to deal with whatever tools we have. And if that is not sufficient, come up with other tools and tooling. And uh, usually we're lazy and just use whatever we have right now in our environment. So lots of, some of the systems that we will explain have been built before us. We are just happy users. Some of that, some of the methods is something we introduced. Uh, so today we're going to talk a bit about our metric store and query capture of uh, systems for uh, that are a bit wider scale Facebook uh, uh, data performance analysis method, uh, systems. PMySQL and Docpile. This is pure MySQL uh, operation stuff. And we also will cover some of the host analysis we have to do to support the high scale workload we have. Uh, so the metric store is essentially uh, at the core of what we have to do. And it allows us to know what our systems are doing and how they are performing. Uh, and any of like people use Cocti, Ganglia, like I've, I've seen pretty much every system and all of them have the basic limitation there which is it's, it's not free enough and it doesn't, it, it provides you too much of structure that you have to use uh, in order to get to, you know, we have to go to some clusters, to, to the servers, see server metrics, but uh, none of them are actually as flexible as they are to, to, to really work in a high scale environment to, to look at things. And uh, the, uh, the, the system we have in place right now that uh, collects the data is something that is based on a really simple concept of there are entities, entities have keys, and uh, you know, and, and those keys have values over time. It's a, a really, really basic time series store design, but that also allows us to uh, really decouple from idea of host and host metrics. The metrics that we actually put there, uh, the, the, the entities that live in that store is from uh, a host with whatever properties it may have to MySQL instances uh, are running on those hosts because we can have multiple of instances and uh, to then logical things like uh, like tables uh, like, like uh, table types or or uh, roles and user accounts that we have in our environment. Uh, so essentially, just type the the way we can put that in is every script that is reporting metric is just providing a free form. Uh, uh, well, usually dotted some hierarchical notation, but it doesn't mean anything. Uh, we just provide whatever entity it is, and it ends up in some system somewhere, and apparently we may use it later. And metrics that we can actually put, like we, usually those are of course numbers, lots of numbers, but the the scope of, of things we, have, we, we are putting there, because our uh, entities are flexible, the key is again, we, we have every tier may define their own idea of what they want to monitor so we we don't put uh, we don't use any kind of a, like real templating it's like we we have a hierarchical uh, setup of what what things and how we uh, what metrics we can collect and it's it's both pull and push so we, we get to uh, from low network to uh, operations and we add even things like TCP socket overflows or or of course bytes and bytes received to disk I.O. for each partition or, or device uh, queue sizes on I.O. Uh, devices individually to, and of course the basic things like CPU which is usually at the core of say Ganglia, we, we don't, doesn't matter as much to us but it's there. For MySQL that also like the show status gives us lots of metrics, lots of them go into the metric store. Like I said, we don't know what we will use, it's not, we, we don't really have like said that like, this is the MySQL server and these are the metrics you will be looking at. We try to send as much of them as possible to be able to look at that later. And of course, replication for, for you know, lag and again, relay log transfer information, bin log information, how much we write, how much we read, and uh, the, the, all, all the basics of course, like threads running or, or connected and table cache. We don't have query cache metrics in our data store though. 
uh, for InnoDB, that is like we, our core storage is InnoDB, and we, we get to we, we have to instrument MySQL to export more of those metrics because you know more metrics in metric store, more usable it may be. Uh, of course, row operations is one of the core things to look at. One of the favorite metrics that we also have, like buffer pool accesses, <laughs> which also provides more insight into logical operations that InnoDB has to uh, the like low level logical operations that InnoDB has to do in order to uh, serve so what it has to besides just fetching a row from it. It's like what it has to do to get the row. Uh, history list length, uh, Mark already mentioned, purge was an issue where we had to manage that and lots of, of the work we had to do was, uh, it's like uh, we, we had to look at certain things like, like these internals of, in, in ODB all the time. IO operations is one of the major cost factor, of course it goes there. Besides that, it's like MySQL is not the single tenant on the box, we have to essentially monitor every other process that is out there, the resource usage, and uh, so we can detect uh, the impact of other operations and uh, other uh, things happening in our systems that live besides. Uh, so essentially, we, we send lots of things for every uh, host entity, and like it's, it, or, or table, uh, or, uh, or, or, or user and other stuff. So again, <laughs> even more metrics come not directly from the host, but from outside. We have, uh, like clients are actually submitting information about hosts they're talking to. Like the web, web boxes are sending information about our, our database machines, the system that aggregates and reports what other res response times seen for particular machines from the client perspective or connect time or error rates. And uh, uh, the, the logical part, the collection of uh, user statistics and table statistics is inevit inevitable at the, the huge environment. Uh, so of course, once we have all the data in our data store, the major thing is like, in, in many cases, uh, we don't want to look just the, at the aggregate load of the cluster because it doesn't tell much. There is a huge distribution of, uh, of, uh, of, of the values and the uh, machines can have different load patterns. So, of course, the major thing, what we have to do with that, uh, as they're like free form entities, we have to group them somehow. Uh, grouping is relatively, like, there are two methods. One method is predefine an aggregation entity, so something you always look at or it, uh, on a dashboard, like, you know, what is the, uh, there's a type on the slide, what is, say, for uh, the average uh, QPS on all the West Coast timeline servers? That is usually pre aggregated grouping that we, we, we define in, in our like, tier level, but also it's an ad hoc grouping. It's like if we can, we, the system that we, we are supposed to use should allow us to query on based on essentially anything like group us, uh, show us the servers that are running the yesterday's build and uh, how are they performing, are they doing less or more IO against the other ones and pre-aggregating all these these things would be a bit too complicated so we, uh, we, we have to support ad hoc querying especially when it gets to uh, metrics that are uh, a bit uh, more complex. It's like, Calculating an average on an aggregation is easy. Calculating 99th percentile on arbitrary set of hosts is already a bit more complicated and requires a data analysis. But if the system is capable of doing that, we are happy and we're using that a lot. Uh, trend analysis, again, is one of the things that in, a, in any, in, in various systems, having an understanding against what happened uh, either yesterday or last week compared to what happened today, because pushes happen every week, we really have to understand how, what how, how it changed. So we end up having uh, <laughs> more and more tools telling us what should what the, was the expected trend and uh, how do we actually look at uh, and how does it go against what is actually happening. And our most favorite feature is of course the top end graphs that we were talking a lot about is show me for any metric and any ad hoc group uh, hosts that have top 10 uh, average or max or maximum values or or my, uh, highest percentile values, so we can actually figure out what are the edge cases in our environment and, and start working on them. Uh, the top end example, essentially, this is the beautiful graph. We took away everything that is useful except some lines. Uh, so I, I, I always like those, those lines in the middle. They, they're essentially the high performance baseline we may have on any, in, for any metric. Now, there is that. Uh, pink line for those who don't see it that well is the one that is crazy. So 
this is the one that we start looking at. Like, what happened there? It's like the the top n essentially gives us uh, an immediate way to for like for human perception and eye to detect uh, uh, something that is different. And you know, we don't like different things. Uh, like a bit nasty at that. So again, this kind of analysis allowed us to. Uh, bypass pretty much every other method and like if you want to be busy just look at top end chart and start nailing down every uh, every offender and uh, it's the easiest way from a performance engineer perspective to approach a system of course there are way more you know impactful way if you understand your system more and, and like if the thing is, there might be a hundred outliers that have some other behavior uh, but Again, increase the N, and you, s you start seeing more colors and more lines, and it's apparently, unfortunately, this method, as you understand, I guess most of the people understand it, out of X entities multiplied by uh, the amount of time points that are shown on the graph, the amount of data we pull in for these kinds of charts is a lot, and compared to what we display, and aggregating that is relatively impossible. So. Our data metrics, uh, the store people, they, at first they didn't like us until we started using these methods on their own systems to show how to improve them. So now we are allowed to use top end charts. But this is one of the things, if you're working on a performance of any system and someone else is maintaining your data store, this is like, no, no, I'm, I have to do this. Like you can point to this presentation, like they said that we must have this data access. Uh, transformations, of course, is uh, something that uh, <laughs> graphs don't always uh, give, give justice. Uh, Jeremy Cole gave a great example of uh, how rate of change in replication is uh, uh, more interesting than actual replication lag counter. And indeed, uh, understanding is if something is getting better or worse instead of and, and, and understanding the rate and the slope of it compared to other changes is one of the most uh, is is really useful. The moving average, of course, is uh, in, in many cases there are lots of spikes and patterns compared to like there are lots of uh, other uh, is, like, com com components in the system that constantly do something with, with what you're observing and they can uh, really make uh, these charts difficult to understand. I, I don't know how many of you can like really average charts properly in your mind but I, apparently once you apply a moving average uh, function on a graph, it's much more easy to understand. I was like, whenever you look at those spikes, it just makes the head, head explode sometimes. Um, and again, the, it sounds simple, but uh, <laughs> dashboards for us is something where, that we create based on the idea of what we want to see. This is, a, in, in, many, in many monitoring systems, and the performance analysis systems dashboard is something that comes first, and then you go a deep dive, uh, like th th then you start looking at the collection of, of the data inside there. It's, it's the, the the monitoring is like it predefines on what you're going to collect. For us, it's opposite. First, we collect data, then we come up with a dashboard. Like, should we just have a uh, dashboard with all the top end charts of various metrics, or should we have uh, per user distributions of, of various uh, uh, of various metrics and so on? So it's like. It allows from like really top level, like the idea of having a flexible dashboard is just put lots of charts of whatever type. And we have all kinds of them, like from uh, uh, aggregate level of uh, the, the data center or like the whole system level to see or uh, say how many rows we're changing or how many rows we're reading so we can provide a number for a fancy presentation somewhere to actual uh, like deep dive and having single dashboard of per host specific metrics uh, group by, for example, InnoDB internals versus <laughs> the, the workload versus the, the user composition and so on. And uh, again, these, these can you like usually we group similar kind of metrics, uh, but even then uh, sometimes combining things like worst offenders towards the data center load is actually a good example, uh, a good way to see how much of edge cases are impacting your overall system operation. Uh, of course, we, you know, looking at those charts uh, doesn't always give us details about what is going on, and which, which is where we wrote something that is called pMySQL. pMySQL is a MySQL command line client that is uh, used for accessing clusters of servers. Uh, 
I don't have exact timings now, but I can say that, for example, for a thousand servers, it can run a query in under 100 milliseconds uh, for increasing you know, the number of thousands, the time slightly gets in, uh, increasing as well. And the, uh, the tool that it essentially gives us uh, the like, snapshot of what is happening in our <laughs> systems at any point in time, and we can always like, modify and get real-time information from the whole form of, of systems and, and do uh, various things with it. Some of them are really simple, uh, some of them a bit more complicated. So, one of the, uh, we open sourced that in our MySQL Facebook to, uh, tools uh, package, and um, we built it to, to, to be able to script on that as well. It's not a, a command line that is easiest to use and uh, for, for like interactive uh, method. method. It's, it's really, in, in this case, I don't know if you can see well on the slide, it's the font is somewhat vertically challenged. Uh, something like go to all the servers and fetch the global status variable uh, which says that the version is from yesterday and uh, show and the and the server has been started longer than a few hours ago and tell me what kind of replication lag it has and so on it's like it's th these are of course these lines are a bit longer apparently if you have a 13 screen it fits on a single line um, but th these allow us to query all the servers at once and get the snapshot of uh, say replication lag for a certain condition of servers and getting that uh, out of uh, like more generalized uh, stores of course they, they would provide us with graphing but in this case we can get exact information on which service should be acted upon right now and I do, we, we can identify uh, problems uh, within a second or, or less um, and of course the most useful uh, thing for, for that we uh, we use it all the time it's like everyone uh, who works on query performance essentially has an alias of one kind or another that does select from information schema process list uh, and searches by keyword or by time or, and uh, essentially provides us with poor man's query profiling. Uh, we can go on and build incredibly complicated uh, query analysis systems but if we just by looking at snapshots, we get uh, of all the servers what are they, they are running. You know, if you look at 10,000 or 100,000 queries running at once, you immediately see uh, can identify patterns in your workload and understand the costs because a running query is the one that is taking the resources. And the best part is that you, like we can really go for ad hoc analysis of uh, what is going on and extracting uh, information from query comments. We can look at the data center composition. We can look at, for example, API, how much of uh, workload is being contributed by different API applications. How much is iPhone? How much is Android? How much is uh, uh, album viewing? How much is, it's like, we have some, quite a bit of that information in our query comments, and then we can use that for from a global snapshot to give us pretty much immediate answers, like understanding of the API contribution right now to the cluster is just running a single command and getting a snapshot in under, under a second, for example. So these, these usages for us have been uh, uh, ability to do that and without too much of pain and like in a really fast way have, uh, have really take, taken away lots of time from, the, you know, from, from trying to get that information and given us much more time into trying to understand it. Then about some of the other assistance Harrison is going to. Thank you, Domas. So um, I'm going to talk a about a couple more systems that we have. Uh, the first one is something we call Query Capture. Uh, of course, it has some internal code name, but Query Capture is what we're going to call it. So basically, the idea is uh, Facebook uh, is a website, primarily. Um, access through lots of different ways, but uh, the general idea is we want to see what's going on uh, in our actual page views. So we have a system which is heavily sampled, uh, but basically we'll decide, I'm going to record every single thing that happens on this page. So that'll be memcache requests, it'll be, uh, in our case, database requests, which are the ones we really care about for us. Um, and basically it'll capture uh, the entire interaction for that entire web page generation. So you know, maybe if we had to talk to three databases and do these 10 queries or whatever the case might be, uh, it'll basically record that entire uh, snapshot uh, in that case. So for database queries, uh, one of the other things we capture with that is all these show session status uh, variables. 
So basically, uh, we do that command before and after every query, subtract some numbers, and we can see exactly what that query was doing. We get things like how many handler accesses it had, if it had to do sorting, uh, if it had to, uh, how many rows were examined versus returned, so we can find things like index usage based on that. Uh, we can say, okay, you know, it, uh, it had to read a thousand rows, only return three, so that shows us that that wasn't working very well. Uh, and all sorts of other information that you can see uh, uh, from within the, the, these, these SESM status. In addition, it also records some metadata for the page request, so the page request itself, what page it was, uh, it'll record uh, various other information uh, about that page request, how long it took, uh, if it was API versus not, and so on. So here's an example of what uh, a request actually looks like. So uh, this is a request that uh, is basically logged into there. Uh, kind of hard to read, but basically we can see that there was four queries. It took a total of 13.8 milliseconds for this page request. It connected to two databases, had two connections. So then it actually can give us a log of what they are. So these queries are normalized, and then you can actually like click on the query and it'll show us you know, all the different pages that request that. We can also view this based on a, on a page basis. So we can say, okay, uh, as, has the number of requests for this particular page changed, or how many, uh, it's access time, all of those sorts of things. So basically we're able to, to take these snapshots and then slice and dice them in various different ways to basically find out, okay, uh, this page is a problem, this API call is very expensive, um, uh, uh, this host is having problems and so on. And so it actually shows us a list of them there, uh, the duration, you know, all the different milliseconds they all took, all the different selects, and so on. So you can see I have the little colored bars, so we can't see host names, but you can see the, the, the connects and the select statements going to those. And so basically from this, we're able to find uh, all sorts of uh, problems. So what sorts of problems? Well, things like long-term trending of queries. So this query, you know, has been run for you know, the last six months. Suddenly it became slower for some reason. Why? Well, maybe we added a new index and the optimizer decided to do something uh, th uh, stupid that it really shouldn't be doing. Another useful thing is finding all access patterns for a table. So sometimes we have a table that is just bad. Like uh, from our table stats, we can see that there's lots of access going to this. It's not very efficient, whatever. So uh, we can do a wildcard search for our queries and say, give me all the queries that access this table. Pretty nice, then we can go in there and optimize the table, reorganize it, decide, you know, okay, we need these indexes, not these indexes, we should change the structure like so, we should migrate it, we should do whatever uh, the case might be. So finding expensive queries, uh, so again, uh, uh, since we do aggregation on the queries, it's very easy to sort. We can say, you know, uh, give us all the queries that have, you know, lots of rows examined or all the queries that have, you know, uh, very large data sets. So it records things like how many, uh, the bytes of data sets, the amount of data returned, all those sorts of things. So we can find out all sorts of information there. The final thing, impact of nested queries and fan out. So one of the things that uh, we find sometimes, uh, we try to avoid hopefully not seeing this much, but uh, sometimes things are connecting to huge amounts of databases and doing lots and lots of queries. Uh, so if things aren't cached properly or the things aren't designed properly, sometimes we'll see things like a thousand database connections all doing a thousand uh, queries. So things like that, so you're able to see not only you know, individual expensive queries, but we can see those web pages that are doing lots and lots and lots of very quick requests, uh, but we're able to quickly uh, and easily find those and then track them down and fix those. So, so um, the way this actually works is all implemented basically on our client side, so our client is what keeps track of you know, all this stuff going on and then it just stuffs it into a database somewhere and then we pull it out and we can do graphs. So uh, here's an example of query response over time. So this is uh, relatively commonly used queries, uh, query in our system. And so we can see it gives us you know, the average and also gives us all the, uh, the percentiles. So we can see 90th percentile, 99th percentile and add them to graphs and see what's going on there. So we can see there's a problem uh, with that query for some reason on that day. Uh, maybe you know, we're altering that table, we're doing something that, that causes an impact. Uh, in that case, we don't care too much, but we can see the overall trend, see if it's getting worse or better, or whatever the case might be. We can also see impacts of improvements. You know, so we add a new index. Hey, look at this query now is now 10% uh, faster or something like that. So it's really nice to be able to actually get the information on a query basis. So. The next tool I want to talk about uh, is a tool that Domas uh, created called Dogpile D. So what Dogpile D does is it uh, produces dog piles. Uh, yeah. So uh, what is a dog pile? 
So basically, uh, a dog pile is when a MySQL server is backed up. It's, it's not looking good. Uh, it's a pile of poop. Um, and we want to basically figure out what's going on there. So it's similar to ptstock, uh, that's the open source you know, Percona tool, uh, but it's our incident time forensic tool chain. So whenever it notices a problem, a problem in our case, uh, it's uh, changeable, but in our case, it's if uh, there's uh, more than 200 threads running at any given time. So if we have 200 threads running, it then gathers a bunch of forensics. What sorts of forensics? Well, things like uh, the immediate host history. So we have some processes that actually run and output information to a log file. So one of the problems with things like PT stock and so on, you can't get what happened immediately before the stall. So you know, it triggers and says, okay, we're at 200 uh, threads running, but what led up to that point? So what we actually have is we have things like IO stat that actually logs every second into a log file. So when a problem occurs, this actually grabs the last like 10, 15 lines of the IO stat log file, adds them into our forensic uh, uh, tool chain. So we basically can look and say, hey, right before this occurred, uh, uh, there was this um, stall on the disk I.O., there was some problem, whatever the case might be. It grabs, of course, lots of other common information, things like the transactions, you know, the actual statements running, uh, all those sorts of information. So the, the, the big thing for us is the immediate host history so we can see actually what led up to the stall, uh, not only what uh, is going on at exactly the time the stall occurs. So, so then, uh, so this runs on every database server. If, if this occurs, it gathers it up into a nice little tarball, ships it off to our central repository, which then actually ha even has real-time reporting to us, so it actually pings us on IRC and it says, hey, you know, I found a dog pile, whatever. Uh, you can go click on it to, to view it, to take a look at it. You can see overall uh, how many dog piles are occurring. Uh, sometimes, you know, if, if there's a lot of them going on, you know there's a system-wide event. Uh, it's very easy to see uh, w uh, exactly what's going on uh, with there. It also gives you historical views for hosts, so when you click on one, you can actually see, okay, this host has had 10 dog piles over the last day. There's something going wrong with it, and so you can then investigate and figure out uh, from there. So Dogpile D, a very, very good uh, tool that we use for figuring uh, out what's basically going on um, uh, in order to cause these stalls. Okay. So now, the, the, the tools we've talked about so far are for like finding problem hosts. So you get a dog pile, you see something from the dashboard, you the top end, whatever the case might be, we then have to go and try to figure out what's causing the problem. So then we have to figure out basically is this you know, a host specific problem or is this one just an outlier? Is, is it a, a wider problem? Uh, and so on. So uh, some of the tools we use for finding out and looking at individual hosts. The first one I want to talk about is Slocket. Anyone here ever heard of Slocket? Like one person, great. So this is a feature we added to the MySQL uh, at Facebook branch of MySQL. Uh, but basically what it does is it enables the slow query log for everything. So it's no longer a slow query log, it's just an overall query log, but it uses the same exact format as a slow query log, has all the same exact information, and so on. So you can see exactly what's going on on the system. And the reason it's called Slocket is because rather than writing it to a log file, as you can imagine, this would be a very huge log file. Instead, what it does, it actually writes it to a UDB, uh, UDP socket. So this will often be a local socket, but the idea there is that there's no blocking, no queuing at all on the actual MySQL server. So very, very, very low impact on the server. So we can enable this on our busiest servers, and the busiest servers continue doing their thing, very little impact. So we actually have a small Python script, so it is a little clunky to work with. You have to create a listener, and then you have to enable the Slocket to point to that listener, and then you have to save it to a file, and blah, blah, blah. But there's a Slocket stats.py, which basically runs, grabs that, and then it works just like uh, the Matkit query digest, where it basically analyzes and chunks apart this file, and will then spit out information for us. So this is very easy. We can see, okay, this query ran, you know, a thousand times over the last 10 seconds, or uh, it'll also pull out things like IDs. So it'll be like, okay, you know, the, the, uh, this user ID, you know, was repeated 10,000 times in this file, things like that. So it makes it very easy, gives us a, basically a snapshot of what's going on on the server at that exact point. We can then backtrace and figure out uh, uh, what exactly the problem is. You know, the memcache server is broken or uh, something is causing this, this host to be overloaded. And so Slocket, really nice because of the low overhead, and gives you a very comprehensive log where you can see all sorts of information about what's going on on the server. So the next one we have is table stats. 
So table stats at PY is a very, very simple script. So basically it uses table stats and user stats. These are the stats that are available, you know, in, uh, in Monty program and, and uh, MariaDB and Percona build and the Facebook build. Uh, and basically it just gives you diffs of times and then sorts by the ones that are the biggest. So this makes it very easy. It, it'll uh, group by things like databases and tables and database tables so you can actually see there's this particular table that for some reason is getting hammered. You know, this one is doing, you know, 100,000 row reads a second, whereas all the others, you know, are doing like 10 or whatever the case might be. So you can, again, use this to find outliers. Uh, you can do it in a either a logical or physical aspect. So you can say logical, like give me the row counts, or physical, give me the IOs. So that's particularly common when you're seeing like lots of disk writes, you're not sure where they're coming from. The uses table stats, just basically runs real time, gathers table stats, runs it again, 10 seconds later, subtracts them, spits out the, the highest values there. Pretty simple script, um, not complex at all. You do have to be using one that has table stats, user stats, uh, but hopefully are because uh, Table stats, user stats are definitely one of the very key components that we use like every day. So the final tool I want to talk about for individual hosts is uh, PMP. Who here has heard of PMP? Hey, more of you. You've done a very good job marketing that. So uh, poor man's profiler. So poor man's profiler is something that was created in Domas's head somehow. Uh, where basically it uses GDB, grabs a bunch of stack traces, aggregates them, and then spits out what's going on uh, in the server. Um, it's very expensive, so we try to avoid using it because GDB does lock up you know, your server for seconds uh, while, it, while it goes on, um, which isn't necessarily a good thing. But if like, the system's already falling over, already breaking, not necessarily the worst thing to use. Um, the way we often use it now is something called auto PMP. So we fixed the majority of long stalls in MySQL. This is something that our team has spent a lot of time doing, working with our engineering team, is finding stalls. You know, if, so for example, you know, InnoDB file extension used to actually have like a half second stall in there, which, which isn't so good. So uh, uh, as we find these and so on, uh, we now use auto PMP. Auto PMP works kind of again like PT stock and will basically run PMP only when there's something bad going on. This is almost always a custom type rules. We don't do it just on threads running because you obviously don't want to uh, have PMP running constantly uh, on your host. So basically you can say, you know, if there's threads running and this query and, you know, the user is this and they've been running for so long. And so we create these stacked rules basically, very small, you know, little scripts to basically kick off and run PMP automatically for us. So then we can gather, you know, what's going on and then uh, go back to our engineering team and be like, okay, there's a stall in here, and then hopefully uh, Mark will fix it, uh, or he'll ask for more information, whatever, and then uh, we'll, we'll get those fixed. We are looking for much better ways to do this. Uh, Yoshinori has something called QuickStack, uh, which he's been working on. It isn't working all that well right now, uh, but we're hoping that it will uh, hopefully replace PMP someday, and then we can gather uh, uh, backtraces and like, 10 milliseconds rather than uh, pausing servers for, for, for uh, a long time. Um, so that is actually pretty much it for some of the tools we use. So we can take questions now. Are there any questions? Okay, in the back. Okay, so the question was about the table stats. Do we add that to our time series system or do we, lo uh, do we lo uh, log it locally? Uh, the answer to that is yes, uh, we do both. So um, the, the time series uh, information we add in an aggregated fashion. So uh, our time series people, uh, when we said we wanted to add, you know, like millions of data points every minute, uh, they were a little unhappy about that. Uh, so instead what we do is we actually aggregate across all hosts uh, the table set information and then log that into uh, into there in, a, in an aggregated fashion. So we still have it in there and we can see, okay, you know, uh, this table is now accessed much more or less or whatever. We can see impact of uh, caching changes, all those sorts of stuff. Um, and then we use the actual table stats thing to actually look at a single host type information. Uh, we would love to be able to have a single host in the time series, but uh, they're a little angry uh, at that. Yes, another question. That is hard to say, yeah. But, uh, so the profile, is that something you have on to all? So, like, you turn on and off, 
Okay, so the question was about the query capture and the, the show session status. Um, so the answer is it is on all the time, but it's heavily, heavily sampled. Uh, it's like one in a million web requests or something like that will do it. Because um, there's obviously overhead. You know, you have extra round trips to the database and so on. Um, and you have to do this math and you have to log it somewhere else and whatnot. Um, so it, it's on all the time, but it isn't on all the time because it's very heavily sampled. In the front. All those tools that uh, Facebook developed uh, are only used by Chrome and Facebook, or can be used by Chrome and community? <laughs> so the question is the tools that we mentioned, uh, can they be used by only poor men at Facebook, or can they be used by poor men uh, in the community as well? Um, we're working on open sourcing some of them. Uh, like, like PMySQL is open source. Uh, some of the others, like the query capture thing, unfortunately, it's so intertwined in our actual like web client code that it's probably not going to be open sourced. Uh, but, but, but some of the others, like the smaller ones, like PMISQL is open sourced, and we definitely want to open source more if we can. But a lot of them are just so intertwined into uh, Facebook-specific stuff, it's not really possible. Yes? Uh, how often do you collect your data, and how long is it stored for? All right, so the question is, how long do we collect data and store it for? I'll let you take that one, Dom, since that was. So uh, there are multiple tiers of collection. Uh, so for, of course, for the local logs that go to, to the disk, some of the data is collected every second. Uh, for the uh, metrics, we have uh, some wider scope of metrics is, is collected every minute. And we have different retention uh, periods. So, so like host-specific metrics, they, we store them for a, a month or so. Uh, then the, some of the aggregations have like much longer storage, and of course we don't store every uh, every minute for our like yearly averages. Like it's uh, we have relatively uh, quite a lot of data points. You can look at uh, the snapshot of a particular day or particular week without just having you know five data points with, uh, with not too much to look at. But uh, yeah. Amount of data we store is is relative. Like the retention for for some things is incredibly long. For hosts, it's usually just uh, one month. Do you find that the one minute sampling isn't always enough, or typically with, with the amount of servers that you have? Like so uh, again, for incident level analysis, uh, it's like for something that is really short term, we want to catch the dog pile. For a longer kind of understanding of the host performance, I, we see that one minute. Uh, is or, or, or five minute data points are enough. Uh, again, it's it's whenever we understand that some host had got, for example, threads running was jumping to uh, to high values, we will start looking at uh, individual hosts with like host specific tools that are usually much more real time and like uh, aggregate. We'll, then we will look at the various metrics that are really accurate at the host level. But from like the, the big analysis, like how to get to that, and then to understand which machines should be looked at, and what kind of patterns are, are emerging in our systems, we usually look at the aggregates. And those, of course, then go a uh, really a long way. Oh, what's your overall metric load? Can you share that as far as common metrics you're collecting? Uh, it's like, I don't know what numbers were disclosed. It's, it's, it's lots. Like, I, 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 like single, okay, single database host may be reporting uh, about a thousand, me, thousand numbers to the central store, a uh, mm -hmm. th thousand metrics every every few minutes. So, uh, yeah, the, the overall uh, is, is quite big. And then we also have uh, certain metrics that are application specific. For example, uh, as we even have if, if a table have multiple records of different types, we may have per type metrics that are uh, sent in by the web clients, how much of time they spend waiting for, you know, for example, for vanity URL, resolving a vanity URL, right? Like these, these kinds of metrics we, we get from like really logical level of application uh, for like the whole workflow to individual operations to the, the, the table metrics, uh, user metrics. A little metrics. bit of everything. Yeah, yeah so a, a little bit of everything. So it, it's especially important so that we can expand uh, of understanding is like, if this layer is having these issues, where does that come from? And then like, go through different and different, uh, essentially, different layers to, 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 to get to the original like, root cause of, of the change. Oh, sorry, one, one more. Uh, so it, it's stored in a time series store, or is it stored in MySQL? It, it, it is still stored in MySQL as well. We, we use MySQL a lot, apparently. Questions?
the one that I have. Yeah. Um, when you do Okay, so the question was the digest tool. Does it run before it ships to the socket or afterwards, right? So the, the socket is is only really there to act as the mechanism for getting into the file. Uh, so so the, the server basically just spews the socket and it gets actually written to a file on disk. But basically the idea is it's asynchronous as far as the server is concerned. The server, because we don't always get everything, like sometimes, you know, if like the, the system is like 100% on the CPU, you know, the thing that actually receives those packets will actually start dropping them and all sorts of bad stuff happens. Um, but it, it does run locally and then write it to a file and then run across that file. So it would be like a PT query digest type file. Also, uh, Slocken and Slocket stats are slightly the couple things. Like we can write lots of real-time aggregation if we want to for like analyzing uh, various metrics that the, the, the script that before didn't do. It's like if, if we want to extract, for example, specific IDs from specific set of queries and analyze this I.O. by those IDs, that we will use Slocket and it will not always go to a log file. We can do just do that real time. Uh, so it's like it allows like really just simple way to tap into that stream without even storing it sometimes. Some, it's easier to write a script when you store a file, but you don't have to. You can do the re edit on, on the file. Can uh, Well, all the dashboards are essentially public internally. <laughs> Uh, well, we export that, like, database engineering loves to look at our dashboards. <laughs> Yay, Mark. We waste too much time. Yeah. Uh, so, we do work with other teams to integrate some of our metrics into their monitoring stuff, like, particularly the user stats. So, we have user stats, which say, okay, this user, you know, is doing X number of queries. Um, and so, then we'll actually go to the team that is that user and be like, hey, uh, Here's your information. Watch it. You know, if it goes up over 30 days, uh, you're in trouble. or Whatever. Um, and, and so we do try to involve other people. Um, and the uh, our actual uh, uh, other sysadmin type people that they do have general overall charts um, of general database health. They don't get into a lot of the specific stuff. We try to simplify it for them so they actually look at it. Um, you mentioned the schema is equal to all this. Uh, you that extract query comment information. Can you give a little, a little detail on that? So essentially, uh, we try to get various teams to put in debugging information to, into, into the query comment. So for example, if you're a graph API user or an like API user and you have application ID, that application ID will be visible at the database query level. So whenever we are running a show full process list, for example, all the machines, we know that out of you know an example of, say, 10,000 queries, uh, 1,000 is, you know, some new dating website that is extracting data, right? Like, if there is some a new pattern that is showing up, we can uh, start like diving and, and trying to understand what, what where, where that is coming from. Or, for example, we, we get endpoints. We know which page is like is accessing that. Uh, we get to see that. We also get to see uh, in a sample basis. We add uh, query stacks to query. Uh, well, applications stacks uh, aggregate into stack hashes to our query comments. So we can actually say show me queries that are accessing this table uh, with, or you know any kind of like on on, on, a, uh, on a format and we can resolve, see which, which tags are there mentioned show all the queries with tags in, in, in the comment and we can quickly resolve that and see what kind of uh, so which exactly functions are causing this this query to happen so it's like anything that can come up to your mind like what logical stuff has to, to go in there? A, mo a special module, a special entry point for that query, a special, you know, any local abstraction that that provides uh, that provides that. If there's a symbolic name for it, you can put it into the query common. And then, essentially, then you know, it's it's just parsing text. It's it's awk or cut depends on you know what we talk to uh, with, uh, or Python or Perl or, or, or PHP. But it just gives gives the flexibility to, to do to see that at the, the snapshot view and from like the poor man's pers perspective, like seeing the the process list of all the servers at the same time is it's really really uh, easy and great way to understand what is going on. I mean, this is like 
the first, the one-on-one of MySQL performance is you tell the person to use show process list. The one-on-one of the cluster MySQL performance, you tell him to use the show global process, like global show process list, not show global. But yeah, it's, it's one of the major, major easy ways to, to immediately see what's going on. It's it's a huge thing. It's like uh, it has huge thing. The interface, the UI is really, really complex. And when we went to build complex UIs, we use internal libraries. So it's like uh, I don't like. You know, the, to build a key, uh, like entity key value store, it's you know essentially just a table with four fields or three fields, right? So it's, it shouldn't be too difficult. But actually, to get all the things into UI and the process to analyze, yes, it's, it's lots of internal things that rely on, on internal libraries, and uh, you know, getting that open is complicated. I, you know, the the way the, why we talk about is just to say that the the approach we we used to get to that data is it's like opposite. It's like collecting. And looking at it, they're essentially two different things. Uh, it's, it's like, you know, people who collect that for us and build those tools, essentially, they're not the ones who are using those dashboards and creating those dashboards. We are all, uh, doing that ourselves from, from our perspective, how we see we should approach the system. Before we started, like, when we found the top end capability that and we started using that, I don't think any other group was using that at the time. We just so started at using that all the time. But it's, it's you know, one of those. The, the, the generalized data store is something that really helps you when, whenever you're dealing with large clusters. Any other questions? Go have lunch. Or go to Pinterest, crash Pinterest. <laughs>